Dave, I'm real proud to have you back. And, uh, you know, it's not easy getting you and you're a rock star. And uh, back to also, you're a member of Tech Coast Angels. I think you still are. And we love collaborating with all the esteemed, <clears throat> obviously, uh, angel groups in America and beyond. So, Dave, we've done probably, oh, maybe a dozen deals together, both uh, in Cresto Capital side, but also with our membership. Dave, can we bring you on and welcome you and uh, look forward to, obviously, your advice? First of all, Randy, it's uh, great to be here. This is not my first or second uh, roundtable <laughs> with Koretsu. Uh, I've done this for Canada, Northern California, Boston. Uh, I'm finding myself in a uh, mini environment here that I hadn't expected. So let's have a little fun today. Uh, if I need to share my screen. Yep. I'm going to uh, show you a topic that uh, you're going to kind of smile about, I think. That means something that I hope that uh, you recognize. And so in the next 10 minutes, we're going to talk about the best advice that startups will never follow. Now, I know some of you will smile because I think most of us have been this or seen this. And uh, I have seen 10,000 deals across my desk. And then if you add the Tech Coast Angels deals, another 10,000. So I've seen 20,000 deals. And there's a uniform theme, and I'm going to give you six things. Some of you will smile because you've been there before. And uh, number five will be a lesson for all of us. So here it comes. These are the best advice items. There are six of them that startups will never follow. The first thing is, I want to tell you a few short okay. hair-raising stories of entrepreneurs that have raised money and regretted it later. Okay. And... Uh, yeah, just want to make sure I'm okay and you can see me on the screen, right? Yes, sorry, you were off that, Dave. Thank you. I just heard that and didn't know if you did. Number one, smile. Advise them never to take money from relatives who can't afford to walk away without remorse. <laughs> Have we seen this before? Do take money from experienced family members only after asking them that they've said that they know that they've responded three or more times. And by the third time, the entrepreneur can be pretty sure that they really aren't being overly emotional or feel that the investor, friend, or family person can't say no. And if things go smooth, they're more likely to remember that he or she wasn't pushy. And that gave them three or four separate opportunities to say no. I think there's a common expectation among entrepreneurs that seed money from family is great. Uh, letting close relatives in at the ground floor smile at that one the problem of course comes if the business fails some relatives believe that a family bond is an insurance policy and that all investments or notes will always be repaid no matter what the circumstance you'll uh, probably recognize this one too coach the entrepreneurs to consider whether the family member being asked to invest has the capability to walk away happily with that in quotes, I guess, from a lost cause. So that's number one. Number two, advise them. Don't take money, especially startup loans, from unsophisticated investors. I was a co-lender, and I assumed the chairmanship of a young startup where the entrepreneur's cousin also loaned money under the same terms. And when that business failed, the cousin sued his own relative, sued me, sued my wife who didn't even know the names of the players and even my family trust which as you all know is an estate, an estate planning vehicle and has no separate assets it took me several times the value of the cousin's loan and legal fees alone and finally a settlement just to extradite my interest from a suit that had no merit whatsoever my attorney told me that it would cost several more hundreds of thousands of dollars to get in front of the judge just to try and get out of this thing Number three, on the other hand, get them to purchase equity. So here's the advice that I would give, and I think maybe you might too. Do take loans from sophisticated investors only after you've tried everything else to get them to purchase the equity. And always make sure they have a clear understanding that if they're going to give you or you're going to give them a loan, that there be automatic loan extensions and that the entrepreneur can make progress and show you, therefore, that the loan doesn't really have to be repaid at the moment in which it uh, is stated on the form to be repaid. 
you and I both know, at least I know, that I'm not expecting many of these loans to be repaid. We know the stats. Half of these businesses are going to be gone in several years. And having these kinds of loans come before equity is comforting. But if the money has nothing to, if the company has nothing to repay, it doesn't make much difference. So get them to, to purchase equity for a lot of reasons. Number one, usually if it's a C Corp, it starts the 1202 clock. I would be very happy. And I've told you many times in the past that I've made a lot of money based upon the 1202 exemption. And by the way, the Angel Capital Association is working hard to maintain that as uh, the Biden administration is talking about eliminating it. So uh, there is a lot more lobbying going on about that very thing right now. So get them to purchase equity. It's good for us. It's good for them. It puts them on the balance sheet. It puts it on the balance sheet without having undue debt on the balance sheet and allows them to borrow at a later time. So that's number three. Number four, a big one. And again, I imagine if I could see you smiling, many of you will smile right now. Have them know that there is an experience trap. Entrepreneurs, don't talk yourself into high valuation for the first round of financing for any reason, even if your hair's on fire, and even if the idea is worth billions. I'd say that this lesson is one that's not only hard to teach, but ignored by entrepreneurs on a regular basis. Friends and family are usually uh, the early investors who don't have the experience to compare value or ask tough questions. And so they accept the word of the entrepreneurs as devaluation. And then when we come in as later investors, we'll enter the picture only after we ensure the valuation is reasonable and comparable to other opportunities for our money, of course. And often I have, and I imagine you have, walked away from a deal if the valuation for that early investment was so high as to cause pain for that cohort. I just don't want the friends and family angry at me for having said that the valuation is less than what they paid. It's just not worth the effort to argue with these early investors when there are so many other deals calling for our sophisticated investor money. Number five. Don't take dumb money. And here, if you're taking notes, I've got five things to say about this one. Advise the entrepreneurs not to take dumb money when the investor or lender supplies nothing other than cash. That's us. So I've written a book. I've written 13 books, and I'm going to show them to you at the end of this. But the first book, Extending the Runway, was the one that kind of struck the nerve. And just to give you the theme of that book really fast, there are five attributes of a great investor, which are, and here's what I meant by taking notes. Number one, the money we offer at reasonable terms. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Number two, our collective ability to guide them with advice about the context, there's your word, of the business plan in relation to the marketplace. They could be doing something that is the wrong place at the wrong time, and we know it. It could be way too soon for their market or way too late. There may be a lot of other businesses they haven't researched. So there's something there. And if we look at the TAM, SAM, and SONG, the total available market, the serviceable available market, um, TAM, SAM, and SONG, serviceable available market, and the serviceable obtainable market, they may not have something that is relevant at all. So we need to be careful that we can advise them about the context of what they're doing. And that's number two. Number three is our experience in the process of growing a company. Every one of us, or almost every one of us, has either managed or owned a company in the past. We have made mistakes. We have lost a lot of money making money. Aha. Uh -huh. And in doing that, we have experience that we can pass on to these entrepreneurs to save them the money that we have invested. How about that? So that is number uh, three of the things of the five things that I think we add in the way of value when we invest. Number four is our knowledge of the best use of time, the corporate resource that is the critical amount of time available to get to product to market. It's not the time of the entrepreneur, although it may be, 
especially if the entrepreneur has to say something like, uh, I approve every single change to the program, or I approve every single decision made by all the employees, then it is the bottleneck created by the entrepreneur. But there is always a core time that we have to control in any corporation. Usually early in the development cycle, it is of course the developers, the chief developer or, or the architects time. We need to know that they understand the value of that time and make sure that it's used in the best way possible to speed to market. Otherwise our money's being wasted as we sit on the sideline, letting them try again and again to get a finished product that is usable in the marketplace. And so number five, number five, and the final one, is our access to the extended relationships we have. We used to call it a Rolodex, and now you might call it a PSD file or whatever you'd like. The idea is we've been around a lot, all of us, and we have a lot of friends and a lot of acquaintances, and we have made mistakes, and they have made mistakes, but they know people who know how to get things done. So uh, those are the five, and I can repeat them. Maybe I don't have to, I hope you wrote them down. Those are the things that you can convince the entrepreneur that you can offer. Whether it's you as an individual, as a member of Koretsu, or whether it is you as a part of a group that is investing in a particular company, and one of your members becomes either the chairman of the board or the advisor to the entrepreneur, or the lead investor in the board. There are a lot of ways you can play this game or just a casual member of the advisory board, whatever it is, you have an opportunity to speed to market, spend less of your money and make a more viable opportunity for success. So don't take dumb money. You may have thought, not have thought of it this way, but we have pretty smart money that we provide. So it certainly means that those four things other than the money itself are worth as much or more than the cash that we offer. Okay, and finally, number six, entrepreneurs don't walk away. Well, I said experienced investors, yeah. Don't walk away from rejection by experienced investors like us thinking that we're stupid or we just don't get it. <laughs> Most of us in this world of early stage investing have seen thousands of proposals, good and bad. I told you that I've seen maybe 20,000, 10,000 across my desk. Even if we don't seem to get your brilliant idea, Mr. Entrepreneur or Ms. Entrepreneur, or buy into its value, we may be comparing it to previous lost investments or industry experiences far beyond yours. I've made 204 investments. And as for the three Koretsu forums that I've discussed this before, I've actually revealed my IRR and the numbers of uh, exits and the numbers of failures and all, because I'm very candid with that. I think it's good for all of us to be able to understand. Many of us don't follow them quite as carefully as I do, but it is important to know that uh, your internal rate of return isn't the same as the IRR of your particular chapter. It isn't the same as the IRR of one particular company. So in my case, my number is 104% today, going back to 1981. And is 83% as, as of this moment, going back to 1993, when I became a professional angel investor. And so there's a lot to say about how that happened. I can talk about the, uh, ones that were the giant home runs, the multiples of a hundred times, but uh, those are the ones that made money. There was one 1000 X, there was one 3000 X, but it was a small amount of money in. And so it wasn't a large amount of money out, but it certainly changed that number. So finally, I guess I would say, advise them to ask three sets of progressively deeper questions to us to get down to the heart of why we didn't invest. Every contact should be a learning experience. We can, we can all agree on that. And those with sophisticated investors like us are doubly valuable. So tell the entrepreneur, a well-phrased no could well be a step toward a correction of the course and a later yes. It's an important set of lessons that we can teach. If you go back when I asked you to take notes of those five things, 
it's a good thing for you to be able to tell the entrepreneur those things. And in fact, many of you know of the Berkus method of valuation of pre-money uh, companies. You'll find 300,000 different references to it if you go to a Google search and look for Berkus method. Uh, and you'll find it almost everywhere. It's been used by almost a million companies over the last 25 years. And it attempts to de-risk these kinds of investments. So that number five thing that I gave you of the five things we offer is a very important element of all of this. Well, that's really all I had to say about this one, except to uh, kind of add that we can lose our money kind of like this picture shows, and it's not something you'd want to do. So the bottom line for me, I've had so many stories, I've written 13 books. <laughs> you find them on Amazon. They all tell stories. I've got hundreds of them and they all relate to lessons learned. You can find me at the email address or you can register for my weekly emails in which I tell one of these stories every single week in depth about one of the companies who either succeeded or failed miserably and the lesson that I learned and the lesson that the entrepreneur learned as a result. That's it, Randy, back to you. Well, let's put our virtual hands together for Dave and the wisdom.